Our scripture text really is just one concept from a um, passage in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. Um, <clears throat> let me read, read it to you in context. This is the account of the man who had fallen into uh, sin, committing, committing incest by um, having his father's wife, and how Paul says that they've tolerated him but he should rather be put out of the congregation, and he tells them why, uh, because of the effects of sin, uh, even, even the smallest amount of it, okay? So 1 Corinthians 5, I'd like to read just verses 1 through 8. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife, you have become arrogant <clears throat> and have not mourned instead so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our um, hearing this morning. Well, just by quick way of review so far, we've seen that we do have a, a real enemy the devil who hates us and wants to make us, as Jonathan Edwards would say, miserable with himself for all eternity. Now, the devil can't destroy us, we've seen, if we're in Christ, but we do know that he can get us to fall into sin. And to the extent that he is successful, he will weaken our love for God and we will become less of a threat to him. Uh, we've seen that he's very clever and skilled at making us fall, which is why we need to keep our eyes open for him and equip ourselves with the weapons that God gives to us, as well as the defensive armor, so that we might be able to repel him. He attacks us where we're the weakest, and he studied us long enough to know exactly what that area is for each one of us. His main tool is deception, deceit, lies. He tries to confuse us. He tries to get us to look at things in the wrong way, and we're beginning to see that he has actually many ways in which he can do this. And again, I would just ask you, as we go through this, to review your own life and see whether or not he's been successful in these areas. Now, we saw first that he will draw our attention to the enjoyment, to the fun that sin will bring, but he will hide its consequences. And again, let me just give you what Brooks, you know, the image that Brooks gives, he, he dangles the bait but hides the hook. Again, think of Satan as, um, as a fisherman. You know, we don't have that image in Scripture, but it's, it's true. And he's fishing for each one of us, and he knows how to bait his hook for us, and we just need to know that when we are being tempted by the things in our weakest areas, that this temptation is coming from the evil one. But remember, there is a hook that is hidden in there. And once he gets you on that hook, there will be some pretty severe consequences. For instance, he showed David Bathsheba's beauty and the pleasure that he would have with her, but he hid what would follow his adultery, that she would conceive, that he would fail to cover up the sin of adultery with Bathsheba, which would lead him to murder her husband which would not only result, of course, in the grieving of his own soul, the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit, not entirely, thankfully, but the joy of the Spirit departed that would result in the child's death 
And we know it also had serious consequences on his household. Do you think David was thinking of that when he looked at Bathsheba? There are consequences to sin. Now, secondly, he'll try to convince us that sin we're being tempted by really isn't a sin at all, but rather something good. And again, the idea that he paints sin with virtue's colors. Just think of, you know, maybe, a, again, a rusty old car that gets a shiny new paint job. It doesn't change the character of that car. It's still a wreck, you know. It's not good. And Satan can do that with sin. For instance, he'll tell us it's okay to gather up all the wealth that you can possibly, you know, uh, earn and then to hold on to that wealth. It's okay to be greedy because that's just simply being a good steward. You know, God wants us to, well, if you know from the health and wealth movement, wants us to be wealthy and healthy and to have a great life. You know, that's, that's what he wants for us. And it's not that God doesn't want us to have some pleasure, but remember, we're not here to have just pleasure. We are here to serve and honor him in the few, um, again, the few years that we have in order to do that. Or he might convince us that it's okay to marry an unbeliever. That's actually a good thing because by marrying them, you can bring them to faith in Christ by simply, you know, exhibiting Christ to them. Well, Satan is a deceiver and we do need to watch out for him. So this morning, I want us to look at another effective lie that the enemy has and that is he makes sin look smaller than it really is. He makes it look insignificant to us and makes us think that it's insignificant to God. Now, Brooks draws our attention to this passage I just read to the, you know, where Paul writes to the Corinthians. And he says this is the deception that Satan was using here. Now, one of their members was guilty of incest. A man had taken his father's wife. Instead of putting him out of the congregation, which apparently they knew they were supposed to do, they tolerated it. Okay, they were likely afraid that if they put him out of the church that they would lose him forever. You know, they had some rationale for doing what they were doing. So to justify this in their own minds, they seemed to be minimizing the seriousness of this sin. And Paul, that's what he seems to be saying where he writes in verse 6, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Now, it's possible that he's saying, well, they've minimized this sin in their minds, but realize that even a small sin can affect the whole congregation. Or he could be saying this, that if even a small sin can have devastating consequences, how much more this sin of incest, because I think we have to say that is not a small sin sin. But either way, he's telling them and he's telling us that even a small amount of sin, even a small sin, even a small amount of leaven, can leaven the whole lump of dough. That is, it can work its way through the whole congregation or, perhaps better, work its way through our souls and corrupt the whole of our souls. It can spread and infect the whole. Now, the fact that they were allowing this to continue means that they were already infected by it. Okay? The devil wants to deceive us as to how serious sin really is. Now, I know that you know, we may have our own personal examples of how the devil has done this to us, but um, usually we don't share those examples because we're ashamed of them. Okay? I know a couple of examples, though, that I've observed over the years and, and not you know, by, from anyone here, of course. But when I was in Calvary Chapel years ago, okay, there was a pastor that I knew who would regularly say when concerns were raised about his behavior, okay, something he did, something he said, he'd say, he'd say something like this. Ah, he goes, don't worry about that. He goes, God laughs at that. Okay? It's no big deal. He doesn't take those things seriously. Um, he was actually caught in lies several times and he would just slough it off and think of it as nothing. God's not concerned about that. But the fact is, he is, by the way, we confronted him on those lies and he lied his way out of that and lied to the leadership of the church that ordained him and lied to, well, again, he, he was just a liar and he thought that was okay. Okay, well, just think about how sin took hold of his, of his heart. By the way, the this, this same pastor believed himself to be infallible, inerrant, and without sin. 
without sin, even though he was a chronic liar. I met another pastor, sadly, who married a couple, you know, a couple in his congregation. And as they were, you know, as the bride was walking down the aisle, she was walking down the aisle six months pregnant, okay, which means that uh, she was pregnant with the, the groom's child. So I asked the pastor after the wedding, did you ever, you know, talk to, you, to these two about the fact that they were involved in, you know, fornication and sin? He goes, no, no, you know, they're getting married. So I figure that, you know, takes care of the problem. Well, he was minimizing that sin. That's still a sin that needs to be repented of. Lying and fornication are serious sins, but they weren't taking them seriously, okay? And the point is Satan tries to get us to disregard sin by really getting us to take our eyes off of what God is really like. I mean, God is holy. He loves holiness. He loves righteousness. He's given us a law that actually forbids even the least amount of sin so that we will know how to walk with him in holiness. We get our eyes off of those things. That's what Satan wants us to do. And he also wants us to forget what the Westminster Assembly recognized about sin in, in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Chapter 15, section 4. There is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. Okay? That's true of every sin, even the slightest imperfection, all of our sins, even as Christians. But then it goes on to say, thankfully, there is no sin so great that it will condemn those who have truly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason why we're not going to be condemned to hell is because of what Jesus Christ has done, which is why we need to be thankful, of course, to Jesus for his mercy and grace and for the Father in giving us the Son. But the point is, we don't want to minimize sin just because it's forgiven. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know, how can we who have died to sin still live in it? And Brooks is going to point us to the fact that how can we give ourselves to sin when we realize just how evil it really is. Okay, so that's the deception, okay, minimizing sin. So how does Brooks tell us to deal with this particular lie? Well, first of all, he says, consider how God dealt with the sins that we think are so small. Okay, and by the way, when he did this, I think he was doing this to people who perhaps, well, I can't say they all didn't know him, but um, let's just say in the old, these are old covenant examples, and we do have a couple of new covenant examples as well, but listen, listen to these. Okay? During the time that Israel was wandering in the wilderness, a man was discovered picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. Okay? When the Lord said, don't go out, don't do any work, stay in your place, don't even go out to gather manna, right? Don't do any work. And this man went out to get, pick up sticks, okay? Well, we might say, well, that doesn't sound like such a, you know, serious infraction of God's law. But how did the Lord deal with, with this sin? He sentenced him to be stoned to death, okay? God thought that was a pretty serious crime, and he dealt with it in that way. Now, in this same situation, there was a man who was struggling with another man, and while they were struggling, he blasphemed God's name, okay? So, what did God do with him? Well, he also required that he be stoned to death. The Lord said when he brought his people out of Egypt, this is before they were wandering in the wilderness, that whoever curses his father or his mother, and what he meant by that is not you know, just simply cursing them, but the word means to treat them with contempt. Whoever treats their father and mother with contempt, let me ask you, guess what the penalty was for that, okay? They shall be put to death, okay? Now, God deals with these sins severely because that's what they actually deserve, and we are so used to grace that it shocks us when God actually doles out what those sins really deserve. Now, what we need to do, though, here is ask ourselves these questions. Have we ever broken the Sabbath? Any of us here? Have we, have we ever failed to meet together with God's people to worship Him? Have we ever done that? As you know, He calls us to. It's our duty on the Lord's Day. 
Have we done work that isn't necessary work or that isn't work of, of mercy? Have we made other people work, you know, people serving us on, on the Lord's Day? Have we used the day for our own purposes rather than for God's? Okay, that's one question. Secondly, have we ever blasphemed God's name? Have we ever used it as a swear word, you know, or maybe said something harsh about him? Have we ever treated our parents with contempt? <laughs> okay, that's almost universal in our society. And um, I would imagine most of us have done that in our lives, especially when we were children. And then the question is this, are we doing any of these things now? Well, remember that these seemingly small sins can have serious consequences. They did in the past. And when we see those things, we need to realize that, again, that is what those sins actually deserve, which is why we need to learn to see them in that way. Now, remember we read earlier, Uzzah reached out his hand and touched the ark because he wanted to steady it, and God struck him down. Adam ate a piece of fruit. From the tree, God told him not to eat of, and he brought God's curse on everyone who has ever lived, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me, let me just give you a quote from Brooks. This is what he says. The least sin is contrary to the law of God, the nature of God, the being of God, and the glory of God. And therefore, it is often punished severely by God. And do we not see daily the vengeance of the Almighty falling upon the bodies, names, states, families, and souls of men? For those sins that are but little ones in their eyes, surely if we are not utterly left of God and blinded by Satan, we cannot but see it. Oh, therefore, when Satan says, it is but a little one, say, oh, but those sins that you call little are such as will cause God to rain hell out of heaven upon sinners as he did upon the Sodomites. Now, he wasn't, Brooks isn't saying the Sodomites were committing a small sin. It may have been small in their eyes, but every sin deserves hell, okay? And if we give ourselves over to it, the one thing the Puritans were always aware of is that their congregation may not all be saved. And so he said, hey, if, if you're in the habit of giving yourself over to sin and you keep giving and giving and giving and you're practicing it and you're not trying to put it to death, then you may, found, you may be found out in the end not to be a Christian at all. Okay, so that's, these warnings are always tied into Brooks, what he's saying here. So don't be deceived by the fact that it may be, in your eyes, maybe a small sin, God's not going to care about it. He takes all sin seriously. Secondly, Giving in to smaller sins opens the door to greater sins. So David looked at Bathsheba, and then he began to think about her beauty. Then he desired the pleasure that she could bring. And then he sent messengers to take her. And then David fell with her. And then we see what happened to cover it up, how he had to have Uriah murdered, okay? Opening the door to a small sin can lead to a greater sin. Judas began taking money from the disciples' bag, and he ends up selling Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Okay? If we give in to a little, more will come in. So again, Brooks writes this. Satan will first draw you to sit with the drunkard, and then to sip with the drunkard, and then at last to be drunk with the drunkard. He will first draw you to be unclean in your thoughts, and then to be unclean in your looks, and then to be unclean in your words, and at last to be unclean in your practices. He will first draw you to look upon the golden wedge, and then to like the golden wedge, and then to handle the golden wedge, and then at last by wicked ways to gain the golden wedge, though you run the hazard of losing God and your soul forever as you may see in Gehazi, Achan, and Judas, and many in these our days. Again, notice the warning here. For those who pursue this, that they may not truly know Christ at all, but opening the door to a small sin can lead to greater sins. Now, giving in to small sins can change the way that we even think about God's truth. This is one thing that one of my seminary professors, I had one professor in seminary, 
Well, I have to admit, virtually everything he said was useless, you know, sadly. And he eventually was let go by the seminary because he just really wasn't a very useful, uh, you know, uh, professor. But he did say one thing that was very helpful, okay? He pointed out, and you've heard me say this before, that there is a relationship between what we believe and what we do, okay? And what we do should be informed by what we believe. But a problem comes when we begin to practice something we don't believe, okay? And, and that's where sin generally begins. So he would say when there's a tension between these two, I believe this, but I'm doing this, he says usually instead of correcting the behavior, we change the way we believe so that it'll fit with our behavior, okay? So giving in to sin can change the way we think about God's truth. Again, sin gains hold by degrees. You know, again, opening the door to a small sin leads to greater sin. It often happens gradually. We don't notice it like the frog in the proverbial kettle. But we need to realize that every sin that we commit, however small, grieves the Holy Spirit. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, it quenches His work and weakens our love for God, which increases our desire for sin. And so as we give in to sin, we give in to greater and greater sins until the Lord stops us. Now, if we belong to the Lord, He will stop us. Jonathan Edwards used the example of, you know, you're walking in the Lord's will, you're on top of the mountain. When you begin to get off and do things you shouldn't do, you begin to slide off the mountain and as you're sliding, there's this you know, pit down below that you're going to fall into. But the Lord stops you at some point before you go all the way in because He loves you. Okay? The Lord will stop us before we go too far. But we do have to recognize this from our own experience. When we crack the door open to sin, it eventually causes sin to flood in which is why we need to avoid it. Consider those who have fallen from the Lord. It didn't happen all at once. It happens by degrees. When Christian and Hopeful started to walk in Bypath Meadows, remember we used that image last, last uh, week, the paths seemed like they were nearly parallel. It's just the one was easier to walk in than the other, so they decided to walk in the meadow rather than on the straight and narrow path. But as they traveled, the two paths diverged. And they didn't notice, and soon they were lost, you know, and soon they were locked in Doubting Castle and were questioning whether they even knew the Lord, okay? If a jet, when it takes off from its, you know, it, its takeoff point, if it varies only by a degree, it can miss its destination by miles, okay? We mustn't give in to smaller sins because they will lead to greater sins. So there is no such thing as a small sin, okay? They're all serious but secondly, giving in to one will bring greater sin. And then here's something that uh, I thought was, I've never heard before from Brooks that um, I think is, is a good argument. He says, third, consider that if you turn away from God for something that is so small, and we're talking about you know, small sins, um, it's more offensive to him than turning away from him for something greater. Now, this is the way that Brooks reasons. He says small sins generally carry with them small temptation. You know, if, if it's really a small sin, it's, there isn't that much temptation. But if we so easily turn away from God for a small temptation, we're showing Him greater contempt than if we had turned away from Him for some great temptation. He says, the, the less the temptation is to sin, the greater is that sin. So here's a more extensive quote. It is the greatest unkindness that can be shown to friend to risk the complaining, bleeding, and grieving of his soul upon a light and slight occasion. So it is the greatest unkindness that can be shown to God, Christ and the Spirit, for a soul to put God upon complaining, Christ upon bleeding, and the Spirit upon grieving by yielding to little sins. Therefore, when Satan says it is but a little one, answer, that oftentimes there is the greatest unkindness showed to God's glorious majesty 
in the acting of the least folly. And therefore you will not displease your best and greatest friend by yielding to his greatest enemy. So don't give in to small sins because you're showing God greater contempt. Now, fourthly, consider, he says, that your brethren have chosen to suffer rather than commit. He would say the smallest sin, oh, however, these things we recognize, there's no small sin, but than to commit any sin. David chose to be thrown into the lion's den rather than give up praying. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we read just earlier, chose to be thrown into the fiery furnace rather than just bow the knee to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. You know, those of you who are a little bit older here recognize the name Keith Green, okay? Keith Green had an album called No Compromise, okay? And on the cover, it had a picture of all these people bowing down before this statue, and there's these three men standing in the crowd who were not willing to compromise. And the message was quite clear. He, he had a song connected to that, which I think, even though he wouldn't agree with Keith Green and all his theology, it was a very powerful song. Um, and it was, make my life a prayer to you. I, I, I don't want to compromise, even in the smallest areas, okay? So just recognize that, that our brethren... Have, have chosen to be thrown into the furnace on earth rather than to sin against God and, you know, by bowing down to an idol, risk being thrown into the eternal fire. And, of course, if they love God, that, that's what they're going to do. You know, they're going to honor Him regardless of the cost. Fifthly, consider that if God were to hold that one sin against you, it would destroy you forever. Again, remember, there's no sin so small but that it deserves damnation. And that's what it would do apart from God's mercy in Christ. Okay, we never want to use God's grace for an excuse for our sins. And then finally, Brooks says this. Consider that there is more evil in the least sin than in the greatest affliction. Paul tells us the wages of sin is death even the least sin. But again, there's no you know, truly small sin because it is committed against an infinite God. There is no such thing as a small sin. Now that's why he says it took the blood of Christ, the God-man, in order to take away our sins. And that's why it would be better for us to suffer the greatest pain and the greatest hardship to be thrown into the, the den of lions, to be cast into the furnace, heated seven times hotter. Some of the Puritans would say it would even be better to be cast into hell than to commit one sin, okay, even one, because sin is the greatest evil. God hates it, and we should see it in that light. So Brooks, what he's reminding us or what he's telling us is this. Next time you're tempted to sin, okay, uh, tempted by the idea that, okay, it's just a small sin, no big deal. Remember how God dealt with seemingly small sins, that giving in to small sins lead to greater sins, that turning from God for small sins is more offensive to him than turning from greater or, you know, turning away from him because of greater sins that our brethren chose rather to suffer than give in to sin, that even one small sin is enough to destroy us forever, and that even the smallest sin is a far greater evil than the greatest suffering that we can possibly imagine. Now, again, the Puritans very, very pointed, very picturesque. You know, years ago, we actually, I think it was the first year I was here, went through this, and it just really shook everybody. They weren't used to hearing this kind of stuff. You know, if you read the Puritans, you get, you get used to this. But let me ask you, has anything that Brooks suggested to us, is it untrue? Would you, would you say you, you take exception to it? Or is what he's telling us true? We need to learn to look at things the way that God would have us to look at them. And I think that he's got a clear sight here uh, to this particular sin. So may the Lord help us to see that.
to look at sin as we should look at it and to avoid it at all costs. Let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask for the Lord's grace to do this.